Welcome everybody to our 106th Learn Fast webinar of our series. The uh, uh, been having a great time learning all sorts of different things about AIM software and hardware and tons of great co-hosts. And and uh, you know, speaking of of great co-hosts, we have our most uh, uh, the co-host that has joined us the most times is joining us again today, Matt Romanowski, and he's gonna we're gonna chat today about. Uh, a topic that um, gets brought up to me, uh, and all of these topics, by the way, are 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 based on feedback that I receive from uh, from all of you. The um, chasing a lap time in your own data. We have covered um, a, a lot of different things, and and you know, sometimes we're comparing data against a pro, you know, your, your pro coach or your, you know, or your teammate, or or and, and often we're doing uh, things in our own data. But uh, we wanted to kind of focus this one on chasing a lap time in your own data and and doing it with a goal. And so you, we're, we're looking for a specific lap time and we're, you know, and, and, and Matt's gonna talk a little bit about that in more detail as we go. But um, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, we're going to take uh, um, questions and comments from the folks that are here with us live. If you're watching on YouTube later, um, be thinking about some things you see in the data and, uh, and, and see if some of the folks that are here with us here uh, live will point out the same things or if Matt, Matt points it out as well. So, uh, so it'll it'll be a it'll be a fun time. We're going to bring up some live data, and we're going to we're going to click through it and and, uh, and and see what we find. Uh, Matt is going to discuss a little bit about the background of uh, of the data that we're going to look at. It's uh, uh, from the user and uh, and kind of give us you know set the you know set the basics of what we're looking at to, so everybody understands and then uh, and then we'll dive right in so let's uh let's slide up a slide here and and introduce our co-host uh, matt has been here for nearly all of these webinars either as a co-host this is his 11th time of co-hosting with us or we see him in the uh in the chat box chatting uh with folks and and helping uh helping the different users and answering questions and doing different things um matt is uh one of our leading technical and stocking aim sports dealers he's out of uh, new hampshire area of the country um does uh, you know seminars at the track coaching um he, he was uh he, he spent last weekend in nashville working in the trans am series so uh, he's out there doing a lot of stuff with uh, with data a lot of the um the previous webinars that matt has joined us with has been some, some pretty interesting things with tire pressures and tire temperatures uh, maybe we'll link in a couple of a uh, couple of his uh more interesting um, webinars that he has joined us with, especially on the on the on the tire temp and pressure stuff. Uh, if you're watching this later on YouTube, all, all of Matt's prior webinars will be down uh, linked in the in the description below in, in the YouTube uh, description. So, uh, Matt, welcome to and thank you for joining us again. I appreciate it. We bounce a lot of ideas off of Matt, even if when he's not uh, co-hosting here, he helps. Uh, he's got his uh, ear to the ground a little bit. Thanks for joining us again, Matt. I appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited for this one it's been a little bit since i've been here in uh you know it was at nashville this weekend having a lot of fun there um, cameron from aim was there supporting indycar and um we had a really good time down there and then coming back to be able to do this is just great yeah it's a, a nashville i would have uh I, I probably if i if i thought about that i might i might have liked to have attended that race i, I city city courses street courses like that uh Sometimes they're a bit of a zoo, uh, but that one uh, looked like it was a good time. So I hope you had a good time there. The um, <clears throat> what are we going to talk about today? I, I you know, again, I'll, I'll let Matt kind of go through some of this. I'll, I'll I'll probably run the mouse while we're in the in the PowerPoint. But that but uh, I want Matt to set up what uh, what is the data that we're going to be looking at? You, you you sometimes you analyze data you know often differently. Uh, you should at least when you're looking at a pro driver versus a, a brand new driver or a, a second year driver, or you, you, you're, you set the expectations and you start to look for certain things. Uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about, let's walk through a few slides and uh, kind of set us up on what we're gonna be looking at here today. Yeah, so this is data from a customer who um, is local. Some of the guys around here will notice the tracks. You know, Jeff commented that he's pretty close to me. Um, <laughs> And originally he's got a 2003 Porsche 996 that he's run a bunch of track night in America and some open track days. And that car is known for oil pressure issues. So his goal in getting a data system was really not to blow up his car. It was less about driver performance, though he was interested in it, but he really wanted to make sure um, he wasn't gonna damage his engine. 
And even kind of with the goal of possibly developing some parts or trying to figure out what was going on to make it a more robust engine and car. Um, and one of the things we always talk about here is, is you've got that three-sided data analysis triangle where we always want to try to solve problems or ways of improving, you know, driver performance, vehicle performance, or vehicle health. And it's kind of funny that he jumped in, and there are a lot of people that do this as well, but, uh, you know, most of them, everybody jumps into this kind of uh, technology looking for driver improvement right off the bat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, pleased that I see somebody jump in and, and they're uh, right off the bat looking for, for that uh, that vehicle health side of it. So that's pretty good. Right. It, you know, a rare example of someone that jumped in that way versus someone who yeah. wanted just the driver performance. Um, and when he got into this, he really hadn't done too much. He had four events last year after he got the car. And then up to this point this year, he kind of has nine events. And as he got into it and he looked at the data, he'd send me these text messages about, this is awesome. This is amazing. I can't believe this data. And he'd send me over a couple of pictures and I'd send him back some notes and, you know, converse through email and everything. Um, and as we did it, you know, he sends me over something and uh, I make some screenshots and comments and everything and give him some pointers and some goals for his next sessions. So th that's really where this came about. And in getting ready for this webinar, one of the things that I thought would be pretty fun and judging by the chat so far, we won't have any trouble with it is to get everybody to look at this session as sort of, if we were a bunch of people at the track, looking at data, throw out your comments and the things you see. And I'm gonna give the stuff I see, we're gonna work in what you guys see um, and put it all together. If you see something that you don't understand, put that question in the question box and we're gonna get through all those things to take a look at it and go, how can we help this person? And he had set a goal for himself this year that the data is from Thompson Motorsports Park and he wanted to be able to do a 119, um, which is just a lap time that to him seemed kind of important. I think last year he did a 25 or 26. This year, I think the data says he did like a 20, and he's looking for that last little bit to get him over the next part. That um, last little bit gets harder and harder, doesn't it? <laughs> right. So <laughs> he put in um, an MXL2 and a couple extra oil pressure sensors and I think an extra temperature sensor. So this is a system that is pretty common. And if we took out the extra oil pressure and maybe eliminated one of those vehicle health things, um, we can then look and say, this is the same data you'd get from a Solo 2, an Evo 4S, or any other data logger. So it's not something that is um, a little bit more out there. Like when we look at my data, sometimes it's got shock pots or different temperatures. This is something that's accessible to everybody. If you have a named device, that has GPS, we can do a lot of what we have here. Yeah, pretty so, standard um, pretty standard setup for a lot of people, certainly. Right, so I, I thought it'd be kind of neat too. This is applicable to everybody in the data set, in the approach and what we're gonna put together. And um, one of the things I love and at Nashville, we had a really good instance of this is just getting a group of people together to look at, look at some of the data. We were in the hauler and we had uh, at one point, I think we had four drivers, a crew chief, me, and uh, uh, a crew guy all in the lounge with data up and just looking at it and different teams, different people, but just looking at it going, hey, why did you do this? Why does this spot look that way? Um, and it, it creates this really interesting dynamic where the data starts the conversation to get deeper and deeper and everything. And it gives us a lot of the why and, and puts that context to the data. So I thought this would be a cool session. I really hope you guys all join in and throw some of those questions at us as we're doing it or the things you notice. Um, so we can build on that and see how this goes because this is something you're gonna take from this session today and be able to do in the paddock, in the garages, after an event, after a session with your friends and whoever else is around. You mentioned that uh, you had quite a few people in the lounge of the hauler looking at data and I, I was watching on TV and I, my guess is that uh, that was probably where the best air conditioner was as well. So that, that might've have, uh, might have helped build that uh, coalition of people in there now. There so. might've <laughs> been a few comments about the place feeling like a few. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> here's, your second, here's your second slide, the analysis plan. What are, what are we gonna look for? What kind of setting things up to, of where we're gonna start? Yeah, so this is um, really along the lines of what I've talked in a bunch of the other, um, sessions and what Roger talks about all the time is to go into this with a little bit of a plan because it really helps you start building on everything. Um, 
so in doing these things is his first plan was engine health. So I said, okay, well, we want to look at oil pressure and compare it to things. So I use scatter plots. I said, if we compare it to lateral G, you know, side to side, longitudinal G front to back. And then we also have vertical G. And I've seen it over the years that depending on the engine and the baffles in the oil tank, um, you can lose oil pressure because as the car comes over crest and it, you know, you come out of the seat, the oil comes out of the bottom and, and we lose oil pressure. Um, and then with it to also look at oil temp and oil pressure, uh, coolant temp and all those driver or the vehicle health items, and then jump into the driver performance and say braking, throttle pickup, over understeer. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna show something a little bit different for that when we get there. And then put together some goals for your next session, right? Because we can look at all these things. And if we just say, yes, this happened without a way to move forward to improve it, then we're not really doing anything other than reviewing something. Um, and that's Tyson, that final plan that helps. I'm sorry, Tice did throw up a question that is kind of pertinent at this point that I thought maybe, uh, maybe we would uh, chat about. Is plotting oil pressure on a traction circle an idea? It saves one XY plot on the screen. I, the uh, it, it opens this up for a little bit of a discussion on Race Studio Two versus Race Studio Three, and and why maybe that would be something that works. In Race Studio Three, you can have that third channel that colorizes it. The the, the picture we're looking at here, I think Matt is using RPM as that third channel. Uh, mm -hmm. You could do an XY plot with lateral and longitudinal G and have oil pressure uh, be that uh, that that is another way of looking at it. I'm. Uh, 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 I'm tickled that somebody is coming up with different ideas and different ways to look at it. And uh, what do you, but you can't do that in Race Studio 2. That's, uh, and we, we are going to use Race Studio 3 today. So that, uh, that is an option. But uh, um, we just wanted to talk about the difference between two and three. Yeah. And certainly, I, if I forget to do that, Tice, remind me when we have a friction circle on the screen and let's try that and put it in there um, to the Race Studio 2 and 3 part. I use Race Studio 3 all weekend. I never opened Race Studio 2. Um, minus one time I had, I was helping somebody with a Evo 4. So I jumped in Race Studio 2 to help them out. But I, all my analysis, all my work, um, everything I was there to do originally was all done in Race Studio 3. That is a, uh, that, you know, it is beta software and that, so there, there's a little bit of a risk there. Uh, we have all, we're all finding that there's, uh, you know, there's little tiny things here or there, but you can work around them for the most part. And, and Matt is, is proof of that. But uh, as all of you that are watching either later or uh, you know here live, um, have Race Studio 2 handy, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna yep. go to the track and use it, uh, you know you might run into something that doesn't work well for you. So, uh, but it is getting closer and closer to being something that uh, you can use as Matt does uh, uses it 100%. Okay, uh, did you cover that uh, screen the the rest of the way that you liked, Matt? Or are you? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think okay. we're ready. Okay, uh, what kind of key tools are we going to? Uh, what are we going to show today? So it's something we've discussed before is um, there's some things we can do ahead of time to really make things better. Uh, one of the ones I use all the time now and I really, really like is to have status variables in the dash um, for your alarm states or, you know, things. So in this case, it's oil pressure that we can put in if the RPMs over something and the oil pressure, you know, is over say 3000 oil pressure below 25 pounds that it turns this status variable on. And then we have a flag and it's recorded in the data. We can set our alarms off of that and then um, use that as a way to very quickly identify a problem instead of having to go through and read everything. Um, and I know, I think it was maybe Robinson had done a session on um, configurations and talked about the status variable, some super powerful tool. I really implore you if you have a system that will take them to use it. Um, the other part of this is make sure that you have your sensor sensors in and calibrated. Um, I'm guilty of it. My last session out with my car, I had a temperature sensor fail. I forgot to change it. So I got there and luckily, as um, we noted in my horsepower to sensor ratio, um, I had another one in the system that didn't affect me, but always make sure those things, that's kind of one of your pre-event checks. And then the next part of all this is set up your user profiles. And then instead of having to click and set all these things up, you'll see that I have them in here um, and they're shared with you. So you can pull these down and then start looking at 
how you can best use all these things and do it in a timely and efficient manner. Because as we know, there's not a lot of time in between sessions. Um, this weekend in Nashville, I use them because we had a bunch of sessions that were uh, under, I think we had an hour and a half in between some of the sessions. By the time the car rolled off and did it, we had to turn in some data to the series and do everything. So it's key to have these profiles set up so you can just jump into things. Um, I, th I think as a professional uh, uh, data data guy, right, The uh, or as an amateur, it, when you the more you use this, the more you find out that 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 time you do setting things up saves you so much time at the track. Uh, John Block is a great example of coming up with and, and mm -hmm. Jorge Seegers, right? They, they 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 set everything up where where the actual analysis at the track, based on even on what you're showing on this screen with the status variables, very very quick to get to the stuff you need to get to now, and uh, that is so important to to, to for the the, the pre-event. Uh, set up. Right. And um, Ray Phillips, who's here with us today, is another one that is really big on profiles and getting all that work done ahead of time to make it easy when we're at the event and when we're, we're pressed for that time. There's so much stress and so much lack of time and, of course, stress at, at the racetrack that, boy, you need to get to the information in a hurry. And, boy, understanding and setting up your profiles and, and, and all of that side is, is just so crit critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and then that magic slide comes up, which tells me that I'm going to jump over to, to the uh, Race Studio software, and I'm going to jump over and give Matt the control of the mouse. Remember, Matt, you have to click once, and then you should right. be in charge. There you go. Uh, there you again, go. again, we're going to be looking at stuff, everybody, while Matt's kind of getting himself ready to go. The uh, We're going to be looking for you to come over to the question and answer. If you see something that jumps out at you, we're, we're analyzing this data as a team. And uh, what we're really looking for is some ideas from you you folks to, hey, what do you see? What what does that mean? You know, that, that kind of a thing. And we will bring those in, we'll discuss them and we'll, and we'll move on to the next one. So looking forward to that. Matt, go ahead and take over and we will go from there. I'll watch the uh, question and answer box. Perfect. So um, the first spot I start is we have a, a profile set up that I made for this this webinar and, the, and that I have similar ones for any car that I work with. And, um, you know, I called it the webinar oil pressure study. And what's pretty cool here is this oil pressure RPM 3K, that's his oil pressure under 25 pounds, RPM over 3000, and it's a status variable. So very quickly we can look, because this is all zero, that event never occurred. And if, it, if, if it would have happened, it would have been a one, right? Yep. That, that's the way status variables uh, typically are going to work for us. So the, the other thing I always like to look at is just an oil pressure. And we have that in the column here. And we can see we have our min and our max. And it had, you know, in the, the second lap, a minimum of 29.3, a maximum of 86. So we look at that and we say, well, that's good, right? And then this adds even a little bit more context that there was no situation where it was over 3000 RPM and under 25 pounds. And we can build those status variables at everything we want and not have to worry about where that minimum is, because especially if he maybe came into the pits, if he um, had a really slow spot on the track, there was some yellow flag situation, something like that. It's a great one that, um, we don't have to try to decipher those things out if it if it said somewhere like the first one Tice points out um, lap six and seven, the minimum oil pressure is low. So yeah, lap seven, when we see 13.3, that's probably where he pulled into the pits, but it's something we'll, we'll kind of log and think about to go see um, where everything is. And um, lap six where, the minimum is 22.3. It is a little bit less. You know, if that was a cool down lap, maybe he had the fewer RPM or something, you know, a, a good spot to kind of check. But we know when the engine was really running and it was over 3000 RPM, we always had good oil pressure. Yeah, so Kyle, to me, Kyle that's Kyle one of those. 
I'm sorry, oh. Kyle Watkins mentions that he likes to see the bar graph feature as well. And that, those little blue little boxes up there, if you click on one of those and the oil pressure one, uh, the uh, there you go, uh, you can yeah. actually see uh, now for those with different learning styles, you know, there's numbers or there's uh, or the little graph bars that uh, the little histograms where you can actually kind of see where the highs and the lows were a little bit more. Some people really like that. Right now, we're beta software. I tend to like those. And uh, I turned all of those on and I saved that as part of my profile, but they're not saving in profile. So that's one, it's on my list of things to, to turn into the uh, software team to uh, that it should remember that. So, but uh, Kyle, mm -hmm. there you go. You, I appreciate the, the comment. Other people maybe don't even know that's there. So it's, it's nice to show that. Right, and um, it is a really good point, Kyle, because on something like oil temp or water temp, um, very similar to the bar graphs that we can and the histograms that we can use in Race Studio 3 is if we imagine this with the line function instead of just the bar graph, that really gives us a, a whole session to look at. Um, it's a pretty neat idea, something I didn't, I don't yeah. use enough, I think, Me and too. that would be more powerful, certainly in these kind of temperature things. Um, the other spots I always put in channel reports is I always look for max RPM um, just to see for over revs. And when you know your engine, you know your um, your red line limits before that there's problems. It's a really easy way to look at it and know where you need to look at to see if there's a problem. Um, and then because it's happened to me and I, I've seen so many people, I saved somebody with this problem this weekend. Um, I always look at my battery voltages for minimum and maximum. Minimum to make sure your car is charging and um, Maximum to make sure the voltage regulator or something's not going wrong and it's overcharging because um, I've also had cars boil batteries. So to me, this is the heart. This is always where I start my analysis is I have a profile set up to check all these engine parameters super quick. Um, the, they're nothing more valuable than time at the racetrack and especially yep. the mechanics times that uh, that stuff takes time and if you find an alternator that has gone bad the driver may have missed the light being on and that sometimes is very deep and it takes those those fellows a while and if you if you tell them uh, nothing is worse than a data guy that steps out of the the air conditioned lounge uh, when it's 25 minutes to go before they go back on track. And, oh yeah, by the way, your alternator is bad because you didn't look at it right off the bat, right? That uh, boy, you'll, uh, you know, the, the data guy may be out on his ear fairly quickly. So so I always set up a channel report like this, put in the, the pertinent, most important things and give them a quick check. I do it before I even leave the car, right? And uh, so I can talk to the mechanics immediately and let them know what's going on with the car. Mm -hmm. And with the status of variables now, it makes it even quicker. Even quicker, Because if yeah. you have that status variable recorded, you don't even have to try to analyze the numbers. You can look at it and know your basics are okay because there's no flags. Um, that has really changed for me, my workflow, because I'm just like, Roger, download the data. I look at that. I know it's good. And then I'll look at it again when I get in. But I give the guys as much time as they need um, to jump into that data. Yeah. Um, Kyle kind of has a, a comment there is that um, he's having trouble with the split names. Like Roger said, it is beta software. There are still some bugs in there, but, you know, report them in because the guys on the software team are working really hard to get all of those things and they're working through them kind of really constantly. So the, the next part after I, I look at this is I always jump into the rest of my profiles. And one of the really neat things with the profiles now is that we have these different pages up here. Um, so we started out with a channel report, we have a scatter, we have a time distance, and we have a split report. So more powerful than Race Studio 2 is we can kind of stack these. And I'm just starting to do this. Working with Race Studio 2 for so long, I got used to single page profiles. So now sometimes I force myself a little bit to work through and look at it differently. Um, so here's the one we talked about is I did uh, multiple view, multiple items displayed in multiple graphs. And I did oil pressure versus longitudinal acceleration on the top left. I did a oil pressure versus lateral top right and then vertical on the bottom right. And then I colored these for RPM because I said, okay, as it changes and things drop out, why is it dropping or, or not? Um, and in these graphs, it doesn't look too bad, I don't think. Um, we get a bunch of questions kind of popping up. 
while you're looking, Roger, at, while, you while look you're looking at, at those, uh, let me uh, let me throw in yeah. the the reason that Matt would would set it up this way is number one, the driver that is a concern for this particular client, obviously, is his oil pressure. But what affects oil pressure, right? It, it's uh, it, it's it's the G forces on the oil pan or the dry sump, and it's the RPM. And there's only one other thing that affects it, and and you you may want to work it in there at some point. But it's uh, is the temperature of the oil. So those uh, Matt has set up a screen here where he can look at the most variables of what he's uh, of what affects oil pressure, and he's trying to figure out if and when low oil pressure happens. Um, some awesome questions and comments here. So. Um... Eric, to be able to put the distance with it is, I think, I don't know how hard that would be to put in the software, but a great suggestion yeah, to I, email I in I to agree. see what um, what everybody can do with it. A location and, on track when these things are happening to see if that's a consistent uh, piece of the yeah. pie. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, uh, why are the names here? Sloppiness. <laughs> <laughs> when I set these up in the settings, you have an I did not of, put of in for the labels. So let me back up and I'll just tell you how I did that is and we'll answer two questions here. So many features are right click available. So when we right click in a graph and in a zone, we can go into settings. And in those settings, we can say show the labels. And I should have had those on. Um, and we can change the dot size and the cursor type, some of those other features. And now you can see it has those labels. Perfect. So that was a little bit of sloppiness on my part. And then there was another question there of how do we colorize these again? Two ways now is we can right click and we can go to choose a color channel and we can use our search box and do it that way. We can also click the paint can choose what we want to color by. We can type in RPM. And I have to say the search box is something I'm not sure how I lived without before. Exactly. I use it all the time. Um, and, and so that is so quick that you could, uh, I talked while Matt was looking at some questions just a minute ago, maybe it's temperature, you know, as, as, as temperatures go up, maybe you'd go, come in really quickly and just change it to oil temp and get an idea is all of the low oil pressures happening, uh, uh, oil temp, there you go. Uh, is it all happening when the temperatures get warmer or is it happening uh, at, at different times? It, all things that, whatever you think of, you might want to see, you, you, you know, fairly quick and easy to change these things. Mm -hmm. Um, another great one, Tice brought up, can we plot it on the map? Ah, there so you go. something to remember is right now we have the segments and we cannot plot a channel when we're looking at Google Earth, but we can turn off or whatever underlying map. We can turn yeah. that off. Oh. He's and then remotely. yeah. Color per channel. Color per go. channel. And then we want oil. Pressure. And then go. we get our map here. Um, and, and if you had some status variables that were triggering, right? I, I personally would probably even do it as, uh, as, as the status variable. So it just comes right up and shows you when it was below a certain uh, oil pressure and above a certain RPM. And boom, you find those locations even quicker. So hmm. very, very there's good. an interesting thought, Roger. Do multiple maps. There you go. There, there you go. Yeah. Um, we're all learning, right? Somebody asked about the color scale and how to do it is um, in when we pick it, we will be able to do it. I don't believe it works quite yet on the scaling the last time I had tried, but you can scale here as well. Um, so those are all features that are going to be coming. Um, I think in a very, very late uh, a, a version, uh, a beta version that uh, we're not running here yet on, on when we do our webinars, I believe that custom scaling is already working. So it's, it's that close to everybody, just for you know. Right, and um, Kyle had a question about incorporating Lambda into these things. And yeah, what's really neat about it is you could incorporate the Lambda and do it with uh, Lambda below a or above a threshold. Um, RPM over something, throttle position over something, right? So we're getting status, those full status variables. Moves. Status variables are very, very easy to build and uh, right. and use all the different functions and not have to do math channels like we used to have to do to get that right. same bit, bit of information that's a little bit more complex. So 
when I look at these, we say they're mostly good, but the, the one that does catch my eye a little bit is there you go. I look here and I see some outliers. So now I have to think about it for a moment. I go, okay, this is high oil pressure, but lots of vertical G's. So I go, no, that's okay, right? Because that's a lot of times what we look for is, is these outlying spots. Um, so I think these look, it doesn't look too, too bad here. Um, in the scatter plots, but something I did notice is at the bottom, I did a time distance graph with oil pressure over RPM. And I see all these drops through here. And what surprised me a little bit was how big they are in relation to the RPM. So these would make me think a little bit about the oiling system and especially right here. Yeah, that one is a, that one's um, an odd one. One of my favorite things is being able to double click on a segment and seeing these drops. And this one is certainly an odd one. And this actually, while you're doing that, it asks, it answers a question that Kyle brought up earlier. Uh, as you drag the cursor on the lap, doesn't it highlight the XY plot? Yes, it does. You can see the cursor is moving up above. Yep. And you can pick a low oil pressure spot in the XY plot, and it'll put the cursor where that happens into the into the map and into the uh, measures graph. Mm -hmm. So it's all 100% right. user definable where you click. Yep. So these ones, it's low or oil pressure, right? Because we still have, we can see here, 45 pounds. Um, so it's, this is where me as a data guy, I look at this, I say, this is indicative, there is a problem, but it's not going to blow up. So I don't need to run out there and go, guys, there's no oil in it, there's a major problem. But to say, hey, this situation's here and let somebody who, who has to make that decision, whether it's the owner, the engine builder, whoever it is, make that decision from there. Um, engine builders usually go, oh, 40 pounds, it's fine. But it's my job to tell them, it's their job to say it's okay. And, and we kind of play that game. But that, a um, good data guy like Matt will, will, will see some of these things ahead of time. It may not be something that's a big deal this weekend, but it's, it, let's track it a little bit, right? Right. So, um, okay. The other button I use all the time now up here is this laps button. So we're looking at just one lap. So I go in and I click all laps. And again, we don't see any crazy outliers that we wouldn't expect. Um, you know, these ones we say at zero Gs, it's lower oil pressure. Well, that's probably safe to say that's when he stopped. And if we click some of these points. Yeah, your in and out laps are, uh, are highlighted. If you, right. if, you, if you turn those off, you probably will lose that even. So, yeah. Yeah, you're driving through the pits. Yeah, from the map, you can see it. Perfect. Right, and then they go away. So when he's on the track, we, we don't see those kind of anomalies in there. Um, I think that's that button to me, it's something I click every session, every time I open this. Um, you may not so, know this, you may not know Tice's uh, question, but it's part of the analysis thought process. You know, the start question before analysis, how was the oil level before and after the session? You weren't there with this particular person, but that is, that would be something that would, uh, something you'd want to check if he's having oil pressure problems as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, question to ask. I don't know the answer to that, but it is a great question. Um, vintage cars, it's so common that we overfill them by a quarter quart. Um, you know, those sort of things. Like you do, it, it holds four quarts, you put an extra quarter in, you put an extra quart in, whatever the system is. Um, so this was when he said, hey, I'm interested in oil pressure. To me, this was my first thought. I'm sure there's a ton of other good ways to think about it. And when we get there, we'll look at it. Tice's idea on a friction circle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we jump over to our time distance now, here's our friction circle. I don't remember what I colored it for. So let's, yeah, let's, let's do it. Do it for oil pressure. Oil pressure. And what do we get? So I wonder if we stretch this out a little bit. It is starting to lose a little bit out at the outer edge on the on the lateral side and not right. on the on, on the slowing down side. We're not seeing the Z, obviously, but yeah. Yeah. So this is stop, and we can go in and turn off our ins and our outs. And then yeah, we do see some 
blue points over here, huh? A little bit of a trend that, that might yeah. open your eyes and say, okay, well, in the corners, and especially it appears to be the, the positive lateral G, so that's a right-hand corner. Right. Uh, maybe a little bit more than the left-hand corners, something to think about. Um, so, yep, yeah, pretty cool thought by Tice. It's a really easy way to put yeah, multiple like things on one. Thank you. Um, that's the power of uh, having these webinars and having uh, other people look at it. Yeah, I think that's one I will add to my thoughts because yeah. I usually go in here and I will color this maybe for break pressure um, or throttle position, right? Two ways I always kind of think of it, but um, you know, pretty neat way to to do it. Yeah, and Tice, a great way to save screen room and be able to go through through things maybe a little bit quicker. Um, and it really comes down to uh, you know the, the the throttle position in a G G sum um, lat, lateral longitudinal graph like that is more of a driver performance thing. Are you getting to throttle? When are you getting to throttle? And what you're doing? But using it as a vehicle health tool, obviously oil pressure would be a better way of looking at it, uh, and maybe some other things as well. So uh, yeah, great great ideas to have a couple of them set up in different ways. Right, and then um, I can never help myself. I always look at a speed and brake pressure yeah. and yeah. Um, throttle position. And even if I'm not going there, I use it for me as always a little bit of a, just to start the thoughts in my head. It's home and I, I take a quick scan and I look at this and we'll get into it deeper in the next one. Um, I look and I go, geez, brake pressures. Okay, we have room for improvement here. Yeah. Um, throttle pickups, I see these releases. Yeah. And I go, geez, we got some room to improve here. Um, I look at the friction circle and I go, oh, that's not, you know, it's not too bad, right? We get, he's doing some work out here. Um, and this side, you know, maybe something we can work on in here, but certainly not bad, right? And I always include these just as a way to start my thought process on it, to start thinking about it. So take a look at it. Um, and I'm just looking at Tyson's one, RPM versus throttle position colored with oil pressure. Yeah, another pretty cool idea. Yeah. Um, I, I always want to have temperature in there as well. To me, uh, that, that oil temperature, yep. it always falls with, with heat. So I would uh, think, be considering uh, having a temperature in there as well. So one of the ones I do, I always include um, a status variable and an alarm for cold oil. Yeah, okay. So I don't let anyone start beating on the motor until it's warmed up. And you can turn on a light onto the dash and, and it has to get under, you know, temperature yep. has to be above a certain thing and, and pressure has to come down or else yep. you pop, pop a line or pop a fil filter. So, you know, the filter seal is what usually goes. Yep. So. Yeah. So the car this weekend, it's 160. There's a yeah. blue light until it hits 160. Okay. Um, okay. And then we know it's ready to go. So this one's always kind of like my quick thought process. I take that quick look and I think about it. And then here, it should probably be in the driver performance, but I put a quick, um, a split report so we can take a look and just get some data. Um, I didn't go through and, and change the lap segments. This is the default aim one. So there's a lot of segments here every time the car changes forces, but it gives us something to think about a little bit. And we see it says our best lap here was a 128.36. Um, our best theoretical was a 125.37. We have an average, the medium. And our best rolling was an 836. Um, so something to think about, we go, hey, it doesn't throw out any huge flags of major things, but gets the thought process starting. Um, for me, I usually don't jump into the graphs here until later. Like this is usually one when we get back to the hotel, I usually start kind of poking out here and, and thinking about it going, okay, well, if we change what we're doing, in this segment, which which is better? Because for me, these end up to be a little bit more of a, a deeper, later analysis function. You know, not in the heart of everything, but that night planning for the next day. I love that they're there and they're available if you want them. And you can turn yeah. them off and, the, and that does get saved into your profiles. But that the other three, I tend to not look them at all during this little preview. But that, mm -hmm. that top one, every once in a while, if I see something that is really odd in the uh, split report, I'll go, boy, was that, what does that look like going through that set of corners, right? You know, something like that. But um, you're right. Uh, typically, you'll go to the full screen and, 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 and look at the speed traces. Yeah. Um, David asked about the oil pressure, about it returning. So if we go back 
and take a look over here about it not returning. Um, I would bring this one up to the engine builder and also have to look at the RPMs, right? Because our oil pressure is usually so RPM dependent and take a look if we go across here, how different, you know, the oil pressure kind of comes back to the same-ish points at uh, similar RPM. So I'd say I wouldn't be super worried about it, but again, that's where if there's the engine builder there, I make them take a look at it and make the decision because they're the ones that know the engine, the bearing clearances and, and everything else. I think David's point um, is, is absolutely correct. I don't yeah. see it in this particular data, but I, if I did see a, it drop down and then hold and not come up quickly as the RPM came up, yeah, that would be a, a, a huge concern. That would be a big red flag. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, it looks like it's coming back uh, with RPM every time. And, right. the, and that particular motor, uh, it, many motors that don't do a lot of oil pressure bypass, uh, they do follow the RPM a little bit closer. You know, you get a dry sump or something like that that is uh, you know, bypassing a little bit more. The oil pressure stays pretty consistent, but certain motors do this a lot. And so, yeah, I'm right. good to that. Um, and then what I wanted to jump into, because we kind of looked at this, we go, you know, this one more thing, Matt, before you, before you change that, yeah. you, had, you had one that I think is a great tip for everybody. Jump it back into the split report, if you would. This particular one, I, when I first looked at it while you were chatting, I, I, you went past the best theoretical, the, uh, you, know, uh, you, you covered a couple mm -hmm. of those things, and the, the best rolling, the best theoretical, and that best lap are all fairly close. And, yeah. and that is kind of a key to data people when you're looking at split reports, and you're going, okay, well, that's, that's not bad, but... Uh, in this particular case, he did so few laps and only one lap was at that, that, that lap time was two seconds faster. It is a little bit of a false positive here for us. So it, I just wanted to throw that out there that even though the, the basic things we always look for best theoretical, best rolling and best lap, how close are they in this particular case? It's a little bit of a, it's throwing you off a little bit because that one lap was almost everything that we're looking at. So um, mm -hmm. split reports got to be a little careful. You know, the, the rules apply and they and they work well most of the time. But in this particular case, it's uh, he is not uh, you know, super consistent yet. Um, uh, and the data will uh, would show that out if we're looking at some other laps. So right. Just wanted to throw that and that's out why, you know, I, I look at it. But if we don't have a good sample size, that it's harder to look at. Yeah, we've got um, another data set here that does have more laps. We may not, may or may not get to it, but uh, but I just want to throw that out. Uh, more laps in a split report are better. Mm -hmm. And then I want to jump over to another quick profile I made here. Please, please. So I, you know, it's the gear up here if you're not used to it, and then load profile, and then I called it driver performance. Um, so here I have. Um, a number of measures, an XY plot, and our storyboard. Um, in doing this, if I have a steering sensor, uh, kind of an, a quick understeer plot of steering position versus lateral G is something I like to look at. Um, with profiles, it's something that's really easy to set up and have in here um, and check out really quick. And something that Ray commented on right away, and that was the same thing that I saw as soon as I made this plot, the car is understeer. The straighter this graph is, the more direct the correlation is between how much you turn and how much at corner force you get. When you have more turning, which is what this tail here signifies with the same G-force, you're not getting a reaction out of the car. Um, something that, that sometimes you have to think about a little bit, but when you put it together, it shows you really quick. And I'm going to get to a point to show that in a different way as well. Um, the other thing, and I wanna go through it in the webinar is I looked at this profile after I made it and I said, geez, I should have saved this a little bit different. Um, in doing it, I don't know how often people use, it used to be, I refer to it as the L's, but it's really the multiple plot type. Yeah, multiple and yep. um, a, a real quick kind of RS Ray Studio primer, the first option puts everything together and really most of the time that makes a mess. The quick cleanup is all separate and it gives you this graph. The one that takes a little bit more work, but especially if you're making um, your own profiles and saving them, 
is to be able to number them. And when we do that one next to our channels over here, we get numbers. In doing this, um, I blame Roger. I always put speed on top. <laughs> I like throttle second and um, brake pressure third. And then I'm going to put steering third. I want to put altitude for Tice fourth. I figure if we didn't have 914 data, I'd at least throw that in there for you. He had mentioned it in the chat already. So <laughs> this one fifth. Um, another neat thing I learned from Roger a long time ago if you hold your control key and click this, you make the numbers count backwards and you can overlap stuff. Um, a neat little way is I always click too much. I'm not a patient guy usually. So I keep clicking and I go too far and I can go back. But, Me and you um, the other neat thing, and I hope if it doesn't work, tell us, I like to go in here and set my line size to two. I find it shows a little bit better um, in how we see everything. Especially during so the webinars. When we jump in here, oh, I have one of these off let's turn off steering position for now and hide it okay. driver so we have our speed channel and i think we still have yaw there and i think this is one of the spots where we found a little bit of a beta problem or we might have found a map problem could be both oh no i have lateral so we should hide I think we might have just found a little bit of a beta problem here. Um, but we see our speed trace. We have our throttle position, our brake pressure, altitude, and then we have gyro and yaw position down here. And when I look at it, I say the first thing is if he wants the best performance out of the car, one of the spots he has to do is consistent inputs with his brake pressure and to follow brake, proper brake um, technique where usually we're on the brake harder at the beginning and then we tail out as we start our corner entry to get those nice rounded friction circles. And when we look at that, that's not really what we have in this first brake zone, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. This one is better. Um, Followed here by the we kind of have <laughs> a plateau one, right. Um, and then the other thing that stood out to me really quick when I looked at this data set really quick was um, there is almost no pause in him going from brake to gas. And when I looked at it, the first thing I thought of when I saw this understeer down here, as I said, oh, geez, he's over braking, going right to gas. It brings up the nose of the car and it pushes out. Um, and then as I, I dug in, I saw something different because, and I'll let Tice answer that question, because, right, it was Todd commented the first one's uphill too. Yep. So you and get the a lot. downhill. Yep. And then Tice gives us it's downhill. So when we look at this, I'm just going to merge splits real quick. We're going to zoom in. And we can see as he comes into the corner, He's coming uphill and the exit of this corner is downhill. And we see it in our map here that as we approach the corner, we're coming up. As we exit, well, really from maybe yeah. three quarters away into the corner, the rest of it's all downhill. And when we look at our understeer graph, we see this is where the car understeers the worst, right? You can see that point way down here that's a really bad understeer. And, so, you can, and you can click on it in the XY plot and it puts the cursor exactly at the worst spot, right? Right. So, so we can get way go. down here. There you go. Right there's the worst. And have some of these points yep. and see it, it is in this altitude loss and that slope change that we're going downhill and it gets harder to keep the track into the, um, into the track. And Tyson's point, we could plot that here too, is we could go and say color per channel. The box. It's hard to do that uh, remotely. <laughs> Altitude. And we see it drop here as well. Yep. And from the high point all the way down to the bottom. Um, 
So then you say, well, geez, maybe some of it is in driving techniques. Some of it is in track, right? And certainly I think here a, a fair amount of it's in the track. Um, another really neat thing that I want to talk about and aim, I forgot to give Robbie the link for it, is if you look, um, we can find there's an aim document about comparing the GPS um, gyro to the yaw rate and the difference in those and what the car actually experienced and what the GPS measures is a measure of understeer. And when we look at this, as we click through points, when these are together, and this is GPS gyro and yaw rate, we're in a good portion of the graph. And as those start to diverge, we see that's where we have understeer, right? So when these are the furthest apart in this area, we see these the first. Um, what's pretty cool about this is this is available to anyone with a solo 2 DL, um, a solo DL, any of the loggers, Nevo 4S, any of those devices that have accelerometers in them. So it's a really powerful way to have an oversteer, understeer um, thought and idea that you can take a look at. If uh, and, uh, I, I will put that document into the uh, to the uh, description in, in the YouTube um, yeah. box, not a problem. Um, and when we jump out, one of the points that Ray brought up, and it was one of the things I noticed as well, is in here, we see these throttle lifts. So here, if we look specifically, I'm gonna combine these two so we can zoom real quick, but we see this big lift. So he brakes, starts to pick up the throttle, and we see where he starts to pick it up, we're still maybe halfway through this corner. And then he has to back out here as he starts to exit the corner. John so Burgess, this is one that- John Burgess found that document and stuck it into the, uh, into the chat box. Thank you very much, John. Oh, awesome. Thanks, John. So very, very good. when we jump in here, we can see these two are pretty close. We don't have any real bad spots, but we see these invert. So we probably had a little bit of oversteer right here, right? And we see it in our graph. Less steering, same G-forces. So we have oversteer. We show it in the GPS gyro versus the yaw. The car goes back to understeer when he catches it, when he lifts out of the gas. So we go, well, geez, this is a little bit more than just picking up throttle early. We have track going downhill again. Right, we see that in our altitude plot. And then we have an oversteer moment. So which one caused which? And we go, okay, well, that's a spot in our goals for the next session. We can jot down, um, delay the throttle pickup here, right? Take it a tick later, take it maybe a little bit smoother than this and try to get rid of the lift that we see right here. Um, that is the same sort of things that we see as we come in here in this section. If we look at 10, and we zoom in here, we can see we pick up and then we have the lift. We have a little bit of over, you know, we have understeer on the way in, a little bit of oversteer, we lift, we go back to understeer, and the same thing, right? These trends kind of follow along. Um, Another great X Y plot, possibly for uh, <laughs> right. Not not to do right now, but uh, maybe yeah, that maybe you compare those numbers. Yep. And a great point to David's just made in the the chat is maybe this is a spot where for this driver, one of the ideas that he needs to work with is um, to have that little bit of maintenance throttle, not to go back to big throttle, but to let it coast in. Or um, a previous webinar host, Dion, one of Dion's really great points, Von Mulkey from Racers Three Hundred and Sixty, is if you feel you have to go back to throttle before you get to the apex, we have to wait. So for this driver, one of the ideas would be delay that throttle input, is to let the car roll a little bit, finish out the lateral G, and then pick it up. A um, couple of things I so, see, Matt. Uh, the, the, some folks are saying that the, the zip file for the profiles uh, may not be working correctly. I've got a note for that. I will fix that, and uh, it'll be in the description uh, below uh, and in the YouTube video. I must have screwed that up. Uh, and uh, Todd asked the question, is the under oversteer GPS comparison uh, sensitive to GPS installation method orientation? It is not. The GPS can be rotated any way it wants to. It's still getting all the proper data. The one that it's touchy upon is, it, of course, because it, it's made 
measuring GPS information versus sensor information, you must make sure that your sensors have been uh, are, are, are lateral is lateral and, and longitudinal is longitudinal and they are calibrated. It's more of that in than the GPS information. Yep, yeah, the actual accelerometers. And that's kind of where my slide was at the beginning is to make sure everything's set up and calibrated correctly. There you go. So then when we get to the data set, we don't regret that we haven't done that, right? Because if, if this was installed and it was okay. way off, it's a chance that we can't really um, use that information as much. And Robbie's getting the link uh, for the profile. So Jim, if uh, if you're having trouble with it, drop me an email. My email address will be at the end. I'll, I'll make sure it works for you. So Matt, we're kind of bumping up against it. There is there uh, kind of closing out on the data side. Is there anything else that you'd like to kind of cover before we uh, um, kind of start to close this one out? Yeah, I'd say the, the last thing to cover here is, um, you know, I, I finished my last slide with goals for the next session. So for this driver, we looked at the oil pressure. We, did, we spent a lot of time in vehicle health. And we said, okay, it's not going to blow up on him. He gets to work in these things. And then here, really quickly, like in 15 minutes as a group, and we had some really great involvement, we noticed these understeer moments. We noticed the, the braking things. We noticed these throttle pickups. So then what we needed to, to do is distill all these ideas that we pulled together and say, how do we put that into something that's actionable? So the next time he rolls out, he can have something to work on. And if I was working with them, I would work, I would say maybe a little bit less on the brake technique, but certainly try to tidy it up. Um, and the big one for him, and it is really a big one, is that idea that David brought up is that maintenance throttle, Ray talked about it, um, coasting isn't always bad, is I would say delay that big throttle pickup and go maybe a little bit of maintenance throttle. If you're going fast enough, maybe a little bit of coasting. And then that continuous smooth throttle pickup. So we miss out on these and we have pickups that are closer to this or, um, you know, this one's pretty solid. And that one area um, that uh, a lot of folks using data don't look at all that much, but Matt does quite a bit and I do too now is that elevation. You can help that driver understand that that one problem area was maybe not technique with his, uh, with his feet, but it, it's the tracks falling away and that, that, that he can do some different things to work around that problem as well. Mm -hmm. Another one of those things you can share. Right. Okay. Perfect. There's a couple things that I'd like to kind of cover real quickly as we, uh, as we, uh, Matt, if you could check the question and answer, uh, there, sure. there's a slider bar there. I think that, I think we covered the first three I can see, but I can't see the ones below. There is a, a card that Matt put together that is uh, linked. Uh, I think Robbie's linked it into the chat box. It'll be linked in the, in the, in the description below for those watching it later on YouTube. It's a track day card. It's, it's a, it's a quick data check. Uh, and it goes over some of the stuff that Matt has already talked about here. And then the, the shape of what things should look like. It's uh, uh, Matt makes these and, and prints them on both sides and, and, and uh, uh, laminates them. But uh, if you want the PDF file that has the same, the same card, uh, there'll be a link that's available for you to do that. So uh, make sure you do that. Um, the, um, and, uh, um, and that profile.zip file, I think it's, it seems like it's probably working for most everybody, but, uh, it, I will double check that and, and, and make sure, uh, cover that. I think, did you see anything uh, else down there? I think a couple quick ones to touch on. Kyle asked about the importance of a, um, steering sensor. Having the steering sensor is the best way to build the math channels to go through all that to see what the car is really doing. And I think Ray had covered some of that in his yeah. session. Um, certainly something John Block does a lot. You can find it in a lot of the reference books. Um, that's the best way. And then it becomes a lot about driver preference. And sometimes it's even the car. Some cars have more understeer or less and it's the quickest way to drive it. Some of it's what the driver likes. Um, so it's certainly not a uh, one size fits all. Um, Tim asked about comparing um, to create a line compare graph, comparing the GPS position. I don't know that we can do it in the graph, but we certainly can turn on two laps. I took away your mouse. Oh, so I, now Roger has to drive. Well, I if wanted to, I wanted to read lap. down and, and see the questions myself too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it possible to create a line graph comparing GPS position to a reference lap? I'm not, uh, it's, it's, uh, did he what, hit the inside curve? My take maybe a little bit for Tim was if we turn on a second lap and zoom into a corner, we can see the, the two laps and the difference in the line. 
you um, should be able, you should be able to click away for a minute if you want. Okay, there we go. So if we um, just turn on another lap, okay, and then we start zooming in here. Oh, okay, I see. You can okay. see the difference in these two lines. So hopefully that's kind of what you meant, Tim. That's the most we can pull out. Like we can't plot a a space difference. And I think as Race Studio Three Beta. Um, gets built out more, we'll have a, a way to measure that distance. Um, there's a trick to it. You can shoot Roger and I an email. <laughs> Roger taught me a long time ago in Race Studio 2, because you have that plotting scale, you can super zoom in and rotate it and, and get a pretty good idea of it. Tim, um, also uh, also be, be everybody, uh, kind of a good way to close this up. But if you see some problems, if you see a, Matt and I even uh, hit a couple here today that are our, our little bugs, or even more important, the enhancements, a, a, a measure tool for in that map. Make sure that it, software at aimsportline.com and uh, make sure you're adding those in. The, they keep a, a, a document of all of the emails that come in. They, they, they try to answer back as much as they can, but uh, you know, we have seen it where the, you know, they are putting those into a, uh, into a document and they're looking at the features and the bugs and they're, and they're knocking them out as fast as they can go. So it's important for everybody that's watching this, if it, for the Race Studio 3 side, the beta software, if you see something that you think is, uh, is, is not quite right or not working well, or something you'd like to see a function be added, make sure you send a, send a, a note to them. So it's, uh, uh, it would be very, very helpful. The um, uh, software at aim-sportline.com. I'm sorry if, I, if I, I, I think I forgot the dash. It's in the chat and I'll, we'll, we'll include it into the YouTube description box as well. Okay. And Matt, anything else that you'd like to, that you, you see in there um, that you might want to cover before we jump back to, to the presentation? No, I think, I think we covered a, a ton in vehicle health and in driver performance and kind of showed how we can do this collaboratively with your friends, with the folks in the garage to, to put it together, to give you something on your next session. Perfect, perfect. And Jim, I'll, I'll look into that uh, uh, a, a little bit deeper. Uh, so, so the stuff you're talking about, the links. Okay. Perfect. The, um, uh, as, as always, as soon as we finish this up, I go to work um, for the next hour, trying to get everything as fast as I can up and uh, put together and up onto YouTube. Uh, the, this, this webinar will, will be the same and I'll, <clears throat> we'll have, uh, it'll be, it'll be video number 171 that we have up on our YouTube site. So there is a ton of information up there. Lots of things for you to go search for the YouTube search box. I try to plug in the basics of every uh, webinar and every video we have into the description, which makes the search bar, the little uh, uh, search once you get inside of the AIM data website, uh, a YouTube page, you can click in some keywords and, uh, and hopefully it'll find the, the webinars that you're, uh, you're looking for. So keep that in mind with the search. The, um, uh, we're a customer support company that happens to sell racing electronics is one of my favorite sayings. And um, we're out at the racetracks every single weekend, uh, just going as hard as we can with our staff. And, uh, but if we don't see you out there, make sure you give us a call. Uh, eight, we have an 800 number, make it easy for you. It will either ring to the, to the nearest AIM uh, store that's near you, either our Roanoke office or our, our Lake Elsinore office. And uh, happy to help you guys uh, work these things out. Make sure you don't fight some of these problems at the, if you have a question or two, give us a holler. We'll get you run up and running fairly quickly. The um, the next webinar, I uh, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, the John Block is uh, has become a friend of mine. Obviously, we've known each other for quite some time, and uh, always a always great to listen to him. He's got so much history in this sport and has done so many things that um, uh, I always look forward to having him on here. The one he's going to talk about is uh, Indy, a path to the pole, and now. While he has been on the poll for the uh, as an engineer for the Indy 500, uh, this is going to be talking about uh, the SCCA runoffs from 2017, and we thought this was appropriate with the with the runoffs coming to Indianapolis uh, uh, again this year. John wanted to talk about uh, some engineering and data work that he did with a with a group and uh, and talk about the stuff that they worked on. It's not going to be super data. 
um, examples and, and walking through the entire process, John wanted to take a little bit of a different approach and, uh, and tell the story of what happened. And inside of that will be, of course, a tons of good information and good practices for data analysis and engineering a car. So uh, really looking forward to, uh, to, to John's presentation next week, uh, talking about the, the data story from his uh, 2017 SCCA runoffs working with a team. They uh, ended up, um, they uh, give you just a, a hint of the story. They showed up, they weren't terribly quick right off the bat. And he's gonna talk about the process of working up and actually getting all the way in and winning the poll for the race. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And it'll be a, a very, very inter interesting discussion with John because it, uh, number one, it always is from autoware.com. John does a ton of uh, webinars and, and other things as well that he, uh, that he hosts through his, uh, through his website. So looking forward to seeing John uh, next weekend. It'll be great. The uh, some contact information as we kind of close this one out. There, uh, my email address. I mentioned a couple of things to a couple of folks there that uh, to contact me if you uh, if you need to. Roger at aimsports.com. Always available to uh, to answer those. I, I did have a a period two or three weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, maybe I had some computer issues. I think I've gotten past those. I think I've caught up on the emails. If you sent me something and I didn't respond, please uh, uh, resend. And um, uh, I know I've got a couple that I'm uh, that are very, very technical that I'm finishing up uh, my responses. Matt is always available. Matt uh, answers his texts and his emails. Uh, real time at the track. Uh, I don't know how he uh, how he juggles that many balls in the air sometimes with uh, everything he's doing, but Matt is real good about uh, uh, getting back to everybody as well. So there's Matt's uh, tr uh, trailbreak.com uh, web page, his email address, and his Instagram account. Uh, Matt is really active on, on Instagram as well, showing all sorts of cool pictures. So Matt, anything uh, that you'd like to kind of add as we're kind of closing this one down? No, I had a blast. I'm really glad everybody chipped in and Hopefully this is what you guys start doing with your data as you're at the track. Hopefully if you're there this weekend, you grab a couple of friends and start digging in like this. While Matt was our co-host, we did have a lot of great feedback from our live attendees, and I do appreciate it. It uh, 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 We've done it a little bit in the past, but everybody really stepped up with lots of, you know, pointing out lots of good information where we, uh, and we ended up maybe going a slightly different direction than where we uh, maybe thought we would go. So that's, uh, which is what we were hoping for. So uh, thank you to everybody that, uh, that jumped in. I appreciate it very much. The... Um, uh, Next week again, John Block going to be here on the on the 17th Tuesday, same same time, same day as as always. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks Matt. Uh, thanks to our AIM guys in the background that uh, were answering questions real quickly. I appreciate it uh, more than you know. Uh, thanks everybody, and we will see you next uh, next Tuesday. It's going to be a good time. <laughs>